60 second neurological exam. And to do that, I need a volunteer. So as I mentioned earlier, um, when you have your patient, you want to do a focus examination. So if they come in with arm numbness, then you'll want to examine their arm. So this is not about that part of the examination. This is about the screening examination that I recommend you do with anyone who has a neurological complaint to just make sure it's not spreading further than you previously thought based on what the patient is telling you. So the 60 second neurologic examination. Um, so you have your components of the neurologic examination, which is your mental state examination, your cranial nerves, your motor examination, your sensory examination, coordination, and gait. Okay, those are the components you've learned in medical school. So for mental status examination, all that I do generally is I interview the patient because if the patient can tell me when their symptoms came on, what they did around that time, how they've been doing over the last few days, I know that they're, they're fluent, they're following my questions so they can follow my commands and they, can, um, have a, they have a decent memory because they seem to remember what happened to them. And I can get, I have a witness, you know, if there's a family member, they can tell me whether this is all accurate. So I really, I don't do much more than that as far as a screening examination. So you don't, you don't sort of check for orientation at all? I don't unless the complaint is cognitive. So if the patient comes in with my memory isn't as good, then that's my focal examination. Yeah. Then I'll do check orientation. But as just getting a general overview of the neurological health of the patient, I do not do anything beyond the interviewing them and getting the sort of uh, by osmosis, if you will, you know. Um, now the cranial nerves. The cranial nerves, I can check motor weakness around the mouth by interviewing the patient. I can see, you see the patient. You're sitting in front of them, you're talking to them, you'll see if they have a facial droop, you'll see if they have a droopy eyelid, right? So I don't do much more than that. Now from, but the things that you cannot assess just by looking at the patient are visual fields, and extraocular motility. So those are the things I'll se check separately. And what I do is this. Look at my nose here. How many fingers do you see all together? Four. That's my visual field screen. Okay. I don't cover eyes and do, now if she said two or, or hesitated, then I would do cover one of your eyes. Do you see my hand wiggle? Yes. Do you see it wiggle here? Yes. And here? Yes. And here? Yes. Now, if she had a visual field defect, she wouldn't see that, and she'd tell me when she sees it, and I'd map out the field. But that is not part of the screening. So it's Sorry, just... I didn't see what you did the oh. first time. <laughs> <laughs> like this. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, I would do it down here, not down up here, but so yes. on the sides. And, and if you, you can check yourself, so you see your wingspan, right? That should be about halfway between me and the patient. And then if I move out, when I see them, I see them here, you see them. Yes. You don't really see them there. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Right? Yeah. Okay, she has got better, better peripheral vision than I do. But um, so you can, of course, it's circular, so it's not perfect. I don't have a very big wingspan. But um, so if the patient is sitting on the, on the um, stretcher in front of you at the same height, it works also a little bit better. So you can check that like that. And it, it, it works. So I see people all the time with field deficits on the wards who've had a stroke and they will not be able to see on the left side. And this is part of just the screening. So you're not mapping out detailed examination. That's what I do for cranial nerves. Then for motor examination, I just check drift primarily. So what pronator... What about extra ocular movements? Hmm? What about extra ocular movements? Oh, sorry. Movements? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awake. Um, so extra ocular motility. So, and I do this all together. So I'll do this. How many fingers do you see? Four. Now see one finger here. Follow it with your eyes. Hold your head straight. Do you see one over here? Yes. And one over that way. So she doesn't have to plop here and she doesn't have nystagmus. So I just looked at her eyes. So you can check for nystagmus that way. Thank you. Now, motor examination. So I have the patient lift up their arms in front of Lift up your arms like this, turn your palms upside down, and close your eyes. You can open your eyes, so in, and you can rest your arms. So in somebody who has weakness, very subtle weakness, they'll drift. And it'll not look like that. 
that's functional. Okay, so if you see a patient go like that, they hold it up for a second and then they go like that's classic, right? Give way weakness. But what they should do, and they'll do it pretty well with your eyes open, with their eyes open. You see, not very tall. <laughs> um, so if you close your eyes, you cannot visually correct. So that's why you close your eyes. And what you see happening is the patient goes like this. Do you appreciate that? A slight rotation and the fingers curl in. Because the natural position of the hand is actually slightly flexed, this is exhausting. If you do this, it's quite exhausting. It's not an often, except unless you're a waiter, you don't do this very often. And it's actually quite exhausting. And if you just let go a little bit, you feel like you're pulling back a little bit and pulling like that. So that's your pronator drift. That's just testing your arms. It's just testing your arms, correct. Yep. Weakness. Just weakness. Nothing. You don't know where the weakness is or anything. It's just weak. Yeah. And it, it tests uh, hand and arm weakness. Um, now, if I want to get um, check lower limb strength, I'll have the patient get up out of a chair, which I have to do anyway to check gait. But I won't do that now. But I'll do that later. And I don't always do that. Now the next thing I do is I check sensory examination. Now sensory. Sorry, saying, HF, that's a drift. Yep, that's hip flexion. Okay. I'm coming to that. Um, so that's when you get up from the chair. Um, you just have the patient get up. So that it's just with motor examination. Okay. It's from a flow perspective, it's easier to do that at a later stage. So um, the other thing I do now with sensory examination, I'll show you how I do it. Now stretch out your arms like this. Close your eyes. Now take this finger and touch the tip of your nose and stretch it back out. And now you have opportunity for variation. You can say, touch this finger and uh, take that finger and touch the tip of your nose and stretch it back out. That gives you sensation in both limbs or and finger to nose. Or you can do this, touch your nose with that finger, stretch it back out, and now do the same thing with the other hand. And you've checked a relatively complex command. So if you're a bit worried during the examination from a following command perspective, and you can open your arms. Sorry, it's exhausting. So, what, so the reason why I check sensation that way is because um, it's a good screen for functional people who present with numbness, because they don't realize you're checking sensation. Okay, so this is, so if the patient is functional and I go like this, can you feel this? And they'll say, yes, and I'll pretend you're numb here, can you feel that? No, of course not, she cannot feel that, but when I have her do that, she'll forget that she, it's not everything's perfect, but that's, that's a, it's a quick screen for that. <clears throat> and then if you find anything, you explore further. This is all assuming everything's fine. Okay, so, so you've got a bit of a finger to nose there, you've got some following commands, you've got some sensation, you've got the drift, and now we, and I don't do reflexes. I do reflexes if I think the patient has an upper motor neuron problem in the spinal cord or brain, or they have a neuropathy and I want to look for absent ankle jerks. But most people, this is generally for somebody you're doing a quick screening exam, and you'll get yourself into more trouble than good by checking reflexes, because there'll be one you struggle to get. <laughs> and then you say, oh God, I couldn't get that left knee jerk. And then you don't know what to do with that. Uh, same with Babinski's. Babinski's are not an easy test to do, because most people are very ticklish. And it requires a certain skill to elicit a Babinski without tickling the patient. So this, I see this all the time with our junior doctors. The number of people who have positive Babinski signs in Wellington Hospital is amazing. <laughs> but they just really, they're just ticklish, you know, so they just pull their foot back. So I wouldn't dabble with it, and I don't in clinic. It's, com it's cumbersome. It's think of your Kiwi bulk with their boots on, you know, what they have to take the boots off, and then they have to take their socks off, and then the other side, and you've wasted five minutes just getting to the foot. So I only examine the foot when I have a real reason to do that. Um, so I don't do reflexes as part of the screening examination. Uh, although it is the one thing that everyone always seems to do who isn't a neurologist. Um, because that's one thing you remember. And that's kind of cool to finally do something with a reflex hammer. Um, and, then, and then the last thing is gait um, and, and Romberg. So what I have, if I wanted to check hip flexion now, what I would say is please stand up. Okay, so she's got good hip flexor, flexor strength. That's pretty hard to do. If there's a railing, you might ask the patient to do it like that. You know, put to not use their hands. Now, can you put your feet together? 
Now close your eyes and open your eyes. So what have I just checked? Proprioception. Proprioception. Very good. A lot of people think the Romberg tests cerebellar function, which it doesn't. Yes, if you have a mucked up cerebellum, you will struggle with this and step out of stance, but the key is when your eyes are closed. You can do it with your eyes open. When your eyes are closed, you're no longer correcting um, for your proprioceptive loss in your feet with your eyes. You cannot do that, and people do that. They, they go like that, right? And she did too, looking down to make sure everything is fine, and then getting a little balance going and standing. It's not, you know, it's always a little bit hard to do that, and then you close your eyes and you lose complete sensory input other than your feet. And if your feet don't tell you where your feet are, you will sway. And a positive Romberg is that. This isn't a positive Romberg. A positive Romberg is stepping out of stance. So you can say that there is the patient swayed on Romberg, but you wouldn't say it's positive if they go like that and correct a little bit. Because we do you do for 30 seconds? Um, I don't time it. Probably not quite that long. Um, you tell really quickly, usually, if you do it and it's somebody with bad neuropathy, they'll, they'll feel very uncomfortable with it. And, you know, you do want to hold them uh, to be ready. So I don't think 30 seconds is required. It's more almost instantaneous. And then the one other thing I will do, usually gait I'll assess as the patient walks in or walks out. And sometimes I'll follow the patient just to see them walk down the hallway. Um, so you can see things like arm swing and Parkinson's. But if I'm interested in the gait, I'll have them do um, heel um, to toe walking or tandem gait. Can you do that for me? <laughs> All right, very good. A little unsteady there. <laughs> um, so that, there was a bit borderline there, but so I might explore that more now, you know? So I don't know what's... <laughs> It's probably not a major issue, but now I might, if I saw that and there was a balance issue, I might now have her take off the shoes and get into a little bit more detail in, with vibration and that and the, and the feet. But if she doesn't have a complaint, I'd ignore it. If, if that is not her presenting complaint, that is borderline and I would ignore it. All right. Now let me just do the whole thing and one go so you can see how this all looks in action. Look at my nose. How many fingers do you see all together? Follow my one finger with your eyes. Do you see one there? Yes. One that way? Yes. Can you lift up your arms in front of you like this? Turn your palms up. Close your eyes. With your eyes closed, take this finger and touch the tip of your nose. Stretch it back out. That finger. Good. And open your eyes and you can put your arms in your lap. Now please stand up. Put your feet together. And close your eyes. Open your eyes and walk a few steps, one foot in front of the other like this. Okay, and there you go. And take, thank you, you can take a seat. It's <laughs> so if you do that, you will occasionally pick things up like diplopia or a visual field loss, a balance problem, um, or a bit of numbness, so it's a bit of drift. So I, this is what I do on my board rounds on every patient I see. Yep, so I actually, I did a, a fellowship in pediatric epilepsy, so I love seeing kids, and I will see children down to year six, age six. Um, uh, so I think kids are great because they find it really fun. And kids are the one population I always check reflexes on because they just think it's great. And it's a nice thing, you know, and I have them check the reflex on their mom and things like that. So uh, yeah, I, I, uh, the other th so yes, I do I do it on kids. Very similar to that. Uh, the other thing I'll say about neurologic examination, um, uh, just this is a stupid little thing, but I like I when I do a bit more detailed examination like a facial asymmetry, I'll ask people to smile rather than grimace. And then they'll smile, and it's another little icebreaker. So the the time I see, then I see people in clinic, they're usually very worried because you don't usually see a neurologist over nothing, and they've been waiting a while, and they're a bit tense, and so you know anything to break the ice a little bit. So I find that's a really good one to start with, and I just have them so give me a big smile, and they can't help themselves and kind of like uh -uh, chuckle, you know. And it's 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 nice because you have make that connection with them. The other thing um, uh, somebody asked me about functional patients. 
And there's a couple tricks I thought I'd mention on neurologic examination. I already showed you the, the numbness, um, you know, you can check with the finger to nose. Weakness, um, so one way of checking for weakness um, is to, maybe just, can I just, can, do you mind stepping here? So if you check for intrinsic hand muscles, so go like this. Now pretend this hand is weak. It's very hard to do that. So she, she let me push that in, but she also was a little weak on the other side. Right? Did you notice that? So when I did that. So um, checking for intrinsic hand muscles is a good way of uh, you know, getting, finding whether the patient has full strength on some testing. Does that make sense? Because it's, hard. it's not in motion we do a lot. So you can um, push from the outside like that. Um, you can step back. The other thing that you can do is something called split the midline. So if somebody who has sensory loss on one side of the body, usually because of the way sensory fibers um, cross the midline, there's about a centimeter or two of sensation from the other side. So if you, if you go down the midline and they have sensory loss exactly in the middle, that tends to be functional. They should feel sensation just across the midline. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you go with the pin prick. The other thing you can do is take a tuning fork, if you have one. Now, I have one in my bag, and I suspect most of you don't. <laughs> um, if you happen to have one in your surgery, if you put it to the skull on this side and ask if they feel the vibration, and you put it to this side, they should also feel the vibration because it's vibrating on the same bone, because it's one skull. But a, a, a functional patient will say, I feel nothing over here, you know, or they may. Um, another one is if you have a tuning fork and you put it on the sternum and bend it this way, do you feel the vibration? And you bend it that way and feel the vibration, and they can no longer feel it. So that's another one. And then um, there's something called the Hoover sign. When you have the patient lie flat on the stretcher and um, they have their legs stretched out and they say they're weak on one side. Uh, have you heard of this um, sign? So you can put and I cannot demonstrate this here, but you put your one hand under the heel of the good leg, okay? And then you have them lift the bad leg. And what should happen with the heel of the good leg? Should flex down, hip flex down to give counter pressure. And if you're not trying, it will not do that. So you can do that on both sides. So that's another test um, to look for functional. What did you call that one? A uh, Hoover sign, H-O-O-V-E-R. Okay, everyone close their eyes. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> do, do you get a lot of functional patients? Then? I do get a lot you of do. functional <laughs> patients. <laughs> yes, I oh, do. Okay, so, so. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's not unusual for me. <laughs> Something about me is that really, uh, uh, and I think it's like that probably in a lot of specialties, but I suspect that neurology is more prone for it than other specialties. Well, and they I mean, get weaned out earlier than they do in neurology. Do, do we send them through more because they're more concerned? Maybe to neurology. Yeah, you may feel more confident weeding out functional patients in other areas, is that what you're thinking? Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I do find that, th th and they become such a burden on the health system because you cannot find anything and, and you really need to prove that, that they don't have anything, so the onus is on, you know, it's harder, it's easier to find a diagnosis than to exclude every diagnosis known to me. So yes, no, it's, it is something that, and it's something in particular we use examination for a lot because the imaging will be negative, so that's why it comes up when we talk about examination. Um, so um, how can I not tell you? You guys cannot advise, if, I, if you see every slide now, you'll know all what the cases are. So can I just... <laughs> <laughs> So we've got the we've got ten minutes to afternoon tea, and we'll do one more case in that time frame. So we have a 35-year-old woman with numbness, and um, what would you like to know about this woman? All right. So where is she? Numb? She's numb in her right arm and leg. How long for? Uh, one to two weeks. Did it come on suddenly? 
Um, it's been gradually worsening over that time frame. Constant or intermittent? Constant. Can you read this? Weakness? Yes, she also has some weakness on that side. Does that make sense? No, nope, otherwise she's completely fine. She's just a bit worried. Any visual symptoms? She does not have any visual symptoms now, but she did have an event five years ago when she had a bit of visual blurring. All right, and now you do your syndromic thing and you immediately jump to a diagnosis. So, it's so um, before we go to localization, um, just something about numbness in general. We talked about numbness already before, and I won't talk about everything again, but I've had this question before from GPs, is, you know, all these people with the tingling, you know, what do I do with them? I never know what to do. And basically, if they're numb, if they're truly numb, if they're not, the tingling bit worries me always less than the numbness. So tingling is a positive symptom, which indicates nerve irritation. Numbness is a negative symptom, which indicates loss of nerve function. So numbness is worse than tingling. If you find an anatomic pattern that fits into a distribution that would give you a lesion, it's more concerning if not. So um, if you have bilateral fingertip tingling, it's very difficult to explain on the basis of a brain lesion. That's the concerning ones. Um, also, it's unlikely to have that if you do, if from a peripheral neuropathy if you don't have tingling in your toes. Um, so it's usually hyperventilation or other, maybe a bit of carpal tunnel, that sort of thing. But to have bilateral, you have get TI clinic referrals for numbness and for tingling in both hands. By the time you get numbness in both hands, you really should be a lot worse off. You should also be locked in and have uh, other brainstem problems and diplopia, so that just doesn't happen in isolation because you have to take out a pretty big chunk of brainstem to get bilateral fingertip uh, tingling. Um, the duration, so we've been through that, you know, anything that's worsening, but most episodes of tingling that are benign last an hour or less. If you have somebody who has persistent hemibody tingling for four days, we'd probably want to know about that unless you figure out some functional features on examination. Um, so anything that lasts sort of an hour, 10 minutes, I mean, we've all had that, haven't we? A little, you know, you're on the phone, you feel a bit of an ulnar neuropathy coming up because you're holding. So, I mean, it's, it's not, it's, we all get tingles in the little fingers and these things are not, I'm not worried about. Um, other associated features that are concerning and I'll just leave it at that. So back to our 35 year old patient. So what do you think, what, where do you think her problem is? Say again? Why do you say that? She's got on the right side. Yep. And why? And facial no facial involvement. So you think it's uh, super or uh, infra? It could be a spinal cord problem. It could be a spinal cord problem. <laughs> So we do our exercise. So could it be a uh, muscle problem? No, because she's got numbness. Same for neuromuscular junction. How about a nerve problem? Yes, same caveats as before. It's not typical, but it could be. The fact that she's had the blurred vision um, many years ago, but if it's connected, makes it less likely, but we don't know if it has anything to do with anything. Could be a complete red herring. Um, it couldn't be a, could it be a brachial plexus or a lumbar plexus problem? Um, it could be if you had two on one side, which is extremely unlikely. It's anatomically possible, but very unlikely. So that would be very atypical. How about a nerve root problem? Same thing. You'd have to have multiple nerve roots involved um, to have that problem. Unless the disc does what? How can one disc problem can cause this particular lesion? So if you move it to the next level. So if, this, if the disc is pushing so much on the spinal cord. So if the disc is not just pushing on a nerve root, but on the whole spinal cord, could that cause this problem? It could. So now we're looking at spinal cord level. So we think it could be a spinal cord problem. Could it be a brain stem problem? It could be a very lower brainstem problem, the medulla, missing the cranial nerve 5, 
uh, which is the facial, you know, if it's um, above, a bit the, because they come up at the pons, but it couldn't be, any, it's very unlikely to be higher than that. So it's unlikely to be a brain problem because it's sparing the face. Okay. What about the, the, the blurriness of the decoder is a bit far away? No, it's a, well, it is a bit far away, so it's not a current problem, so then you, you think it's a different one, but that's a good point. So if she had to blur vision now, it's exactly the sort of thinking I'd like people to have. It's like, oh, how can we fit that in? It could be a brainstem problem. It could be diplopia. Um, but it's likely a separate event. So, um, so you think it's a, it's, um, the, could be peripheral nerve problem, not likely because of the distribution, not likely plexi. We're honing in on the brainstem or the spinal cord in a 35-year-old woman with a one to two his week history of worsening symptoms. And what's your diagnosis? So this is MS, essentially, until proven otherwise. So most common cause of transverse myelitis in this age group, it has an inflammatory course of one to two weeks. It's not sudden, so it would make it unlikely to be a spinal cord infarct. Um, it could be a tumor compressing things. It could be a disc, but she has no pain. And pains, you, uh, discs usually cause some kind of pain. Do many of these have um, the students that did uh, maturation or sexual function at the presentation to you and you see? No, they do have those problems, but that's almost never the cause of why they come to our attention. So these problems tend to be an issue more down the road when the acute numbness, weakness had settled and then they start worrying about those things. So I'm not sure that it's not there at the beginning, but it's just not the focus for the patient at that time, generally. And um, primary sexual dysfunction tends to not be caused by spinal cord problems of the MS type, because it would be very focal, and it tends to be more uh, sort of cardioquina problems or peripheral nerve problems that cause primary impotence. So here, so you do your MRI scan, um, and we do a spinal MRI because we've localized the lesion to the cervical cord because we have arm and leg involvement. So it cannot be the, at the thoracic level because otherwise we wouldn't have, then we wouldn't be able to explain the, the arm weakness and numbness. And if you had examined her, and I skipped that because we are short on time, you would have found that she had um, reduction to temperature and pinprick on the contralateral side. So to come back to the earlier discussion we had, so she had um, which side? right arm and leg weakness and numbness to light touch and vibration, but if you had asked if she'd noticed anything else, she would have said she's noticed that when she takes a tub bath and puts her left foot into the tub, she notices she cannot feel the temperature of the water. Mm -hmm. um, so um, she has a cord lesion up here, which is around C3. You may not be able to appreciate that, but a little white spot on um, axial cuts here. You see it's a little bit off to the right, which is why she has right weakness and large fiber numbness and left small fiber numbness. We do a brain scan when we suspect MS because it helps with the diagnosis. So these are typical MS lesions. You see the corpus callosum is a bit chewed up not quite as thick as the earlier scan I showed you and you see these projections going up they're called Dawson's fingers if you imagine a hand superimposed with projections going up vertically from the corpus callosum um, and so uh, that's a very typical feature we see in MS. So to make a diagnosis of MS, we need separation in space and time. We need two lesions that are in different anatomic locations and separated by uh, some time, usually weeks, more commonly months. So multiple sclerosis. So central nervous system disease, the workup includes an MRI and LP for look to look for oligoclonal bands. We can do evoke potentials, but it doesn't add that much usually. Many patients do quite well, so a third of patients have one attack and do fine, or maybe another one, and don't really need ongoing treatment. So it's not as horrible as a disorder as some of us believe it is. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily <coughs> a, a very bad uh, diagnosis. Uh, we use high-dose steroids for acute attacks, so that's oral methylprednisolone, a gram, five days, that's 10 milligram tablets fairly unique to New Zealand. 
Uh, we cannot get this in many other places of the world, so this we're very lucky because it's better for patients to take it at home than have to come get an infusion in the hospital. The efficacy is the same. It causes um, insomnia, though, so that's something you need to deal with. Um, and then there's uh, disease-modifying agents, which we now, there's been some changes recently, and I'll talk about those briefly. Uh, because there are so many, there's quite a number of options now for disease-modifying agents. They all require specialist examination, documentation, and prescription. I think really all new MS patients need to be under the care of a neurologist. So that's one of the few diagnoses that, uh, you know, you're suspicious of it, you send them to us, we make the diagnosis, and we keep them for a while. I'm a big fan of returning people to you guys, and you'll still manage them for other things, but while they're under these drugs, we just need to monitor them. And if they have an attack, we generally prefer you just let us know, rather than starting to treat them, because we want to document the, uh, document the attack for um, applying for medications, and we want to be sure that it's a new attack. We may get another scan before the treatment is started. So we, most of us have MS nurses, um, so they should be readily available. Most of the patients have the contact number of the MS nurses. So um, always appreciate if, we, if, if you help as much as you can, but with these MS patients, we'd rather get the call. We think they have an attack, and we just get, the, we just get them in within a few days in most places. Um, so the new drugs, um, the old ones were the interferon and copaxone, that's your Avanax um, and your, your um, betaferon and the copaxone. They were injections, uh, anywhere between daily to once a week, and you may all have patients who've taken those. And then we have two new drugs. We have fingolimod, which is a daily oral tablet, so that's been quite a breakthrough, uh, very welcome for a lot of our patients. And then natalizumab, which is, or tisabari, this is also called Galenia, it's the brand name, natalizumab is tisabari, that's a monthly infusion. So they're not exactly the same drugs, and um, they have problems associated with them, like all disease-modifying agents in MS. So these are in general safer, but you have to jab yourself. So that's a little bit of a problem. But they don't cause a lot of long-term side effects. So th I still think that those are quite a good option. However, the way the funding goes now, the first-line first drugs are either fingolimod or natalizumab, just as of the end of last year. And in order to use a, either of these, you have to justify that. And it could be that the patient prefers that you're worried about side effects. It's not a very stringent justification, but you need to explain why you're not using either of the other ones. If they're already on those, you do not have to switch, but you can. So the way, to, to, in order to uh, um, qualify for these medications, you have to have clinically definite MS, which means you have demonstration of separation in space and time, so at least two lesions, uh, two clinical events. They don't have to be very close to one another, but they have to, um, you know, have to have been separate events. Some people argue that if you had one event and then you do a scan with old lesions and a new one that is gadolinium enhancing that you know is acute and corresponds to the acute attack, you might be able to argue that that's enough to say you have separation in um, space and time. There's some debate over that in our community. Um, and you have to have, this is new, before you need to have some disability before you could qualify for medicine. Uh, disease modifying agents, that's no longer the case, so all you really have to have is have a couple attacks, um, and then there's an exit criteria. So then your EDSS score, which is a disability score, reaches four, you no longer qualify, you cannot be started on it. If you haven't been started by then, you can no longer start at that point, you've missed the boat, and if you had 4.5, you need to come off the drug. And that's based on the fact that at that point, you're likely entered the secondary progressive state, at which point these drugs are no longer effective. And um, what the most important one is being able to walk unaided for 500 meters or more. So if you, you need to be sufficiently mobile to demonstrate that there's benefit <coughs> from taking these very expensive medications. So they're on the order of, sort of $20,000 a year. 
Um, the concerns with fingolimod, it is immunosuppressant, so you're at higher risk of infections and it can cause bradycardia, which is why we monitor people um, for the first dose. For six hours, they're in, our, um, in the hospital, we monitor them in the iPad. Already two people had to be admitted because of symptomatic bradycardia, so it's, it's a serious issue, but that's only that then goes away with subsequent dosages. But you need to know that if a patient during the first week stops and then wants to restart, they need to come in and be monitored again. If later on, if they've been on it for a while and stop it and tell you, you know, I didn't, I ran out and I didn't take it for a week or more, they need to come in and take the first dose again under supervision. So that's the one thing that you guys need to know about this. Natalizumab is actually generally better tolerated than fingolimod, but it's it cumbersome because you have to infuse it once a month. And if you're JC virus positive, it's not a good choice for you because you're at much higher risk of developing PML, which is a, a potentially fatal brain infection. So they're not, you know, they have problems, <coughs> these drugs, but they work really well in general, and they generally work, certainly metalizumab works much better than the older drugs.